Um, I mean, it's obvious we urgently need to win. Um, we you know most dramatically, I think, because of the uh, gradually unfolding climate catastrophe. But we've also got the threat of the far right. We've got the Tories threatening us with yet another awful prime minister we never asked for. Uh, we need to end wars. We've got all the sabre rattling going on in the Gulf at the moment, poverty and depression. But the big question I think that uh, anybody on the left gets confronted with is how do we get the power to actually achieve those uh, achieve those wins? Um, and I think if you're going to ask that question, you have to ask another question: is what do we mean by power in the first place? And I, I quite like the definition that Jane McAlevey, the American organizer, uses which is that uh, power is the ability to make things that you want to happen happen and to stop things you don't want to happen from happening, which I think has the value of being quite practical. You can tell when somebody or an organisation has power. It also, I think, um, helps you avoid the pitfall of confusing potential power with actual power, because it's easy to look at groups or individuals and think, oh, they are, they're enormously powerful because of their maybe role in society. But to turn potential power into actual power, first of all, you have to be aware you've got it. Um, you have to have the politics or the willingness to actually use it. Um, and you have to have organisation to allow you to use it. So just as a practical example, uh, some years ago when we were getting ready for a strike, we had uh, uh, someone who would probably be known to many of you up here, who was the convener at Grangemouth at the time, uh, came down and did a little talk for a bunch of our activists getting ready for the strike and he was describing their successful pensions dispute some years before and he was saying well, it was easy for us, we had an oil refinery to play with, you know, so they knew they'd got power, it was really obvious to all the workers they'd got power, they could stop the oil flowing. And in that discussion people talked about the comparison with say supermarket checkout staff who I would argue have as much potential power um, in that they have millions of pounds of perishable goods and frozen goods coming across in front of them. If you don't sell them that day, you can't sell them the next day and make up the uh, lost sales. So enormous potential power, but generally speaking, not aware of that power, generally speaking, not organised in the way you would need to be to, um, to wield it. And I think that, that definition of James really helps draw attention to that. So I want to try and talk briefly about three questions to do with uh, the power, which uh, broadly call uh, how, who and where, um, which I think is a good start. So starting with how, I think while as working class people we're not in power to get what we want or stop what we don't want, we rely on cre creating a crisis for the people uh, who are, and that's about disruption. Um, and it's interesting, I think, the amount of attention that's starting to be paid to the idea of direct action, um, so which might include strikes or occupations or other things that effectively disrupt things and cause a crisis for the people in power. And I think it's worth remembering, you know, some of the things that are part of the kind of standard repertoire of the left, um, perhaps we aren't using in the most effective way. So if you think of a term like the demonstration, if you read some of the stuff from the early 20th century, demonstration meant just that, that you were demonstrating that you had the power to do something else that might actually be disruptive. Demonstrations aren't usually very disruptive in themselves. And so how is it we've come, I think, as a left, often to see the demonstration as the kind of high point of uh, a campaign rather than demonstrating something much more powerful that might come uh, might come later. And I think this focus that we're seeing now back on the idea of disruption and direct action is a useful reminder. But if that's about when we're not in power, I think one of the other things you hear a lot on the left is the idea of, okay, can we take power? What does that mean? And clearly the dominant view of that is about elections. And I'm a big fan of the old phrase that, uh, you know, when people on the left win elections, they're in office but not in power. Um, uh, and I think that comes out of a view about where does the power of the other side lie? Is it really in Parliament or in the Council Chamber? Is that really where uh, the rich and powerful get their power from? Uh, or is it from their economic power? Is it from their control of the media, from education, from the courts, from the police, the army and all the rest of it? So I'm not arguing that elections are irrelevant but that they're not decisive. Governments are constrained by social forces, they're constrained by what the money markets do, they're constrained by what the rich and powerful will put up with, and they're constrained by what will 
uh, put up with. I think the other common image you see uh, on the left, and this is one where if you look at a group like Exile, that I think do a really uh, good critique of this, is they see uh, uh, an image of uh, armed struggle as the alternative uh, to this, and they point out that you know if you have some small gang of revolutionaries with their Kalashnikovs or AK-47s, this sidelines the vast majority of people, it makes people passive, it creates a barrier from people participating, uh, and it actually legitimate, uh, legitimizes repression because it says, you know, that these are some small minority of extremists who we have to uh, clamp down on. So I think that's something that's quite uh, right to uh, uh, steer away from that kind of model. But the problem is that that disruptive model I talked about, that creating a crisis, is insufficient. So. Workers, working class people, we ourselves need goods and services. So if you have a big strike, we create a problem for ourselves, not just for uh, those in power. So there's a, a phrase I love, people talk about a strike being a race between uh, workers trying to inflict a crisis of production on the employer and the employer trying to create a crisis of social reproduction, in other words, our ability to uh, feed and house and have energy and all the other things we need for, for, for us and it's whoever kind of runs out of that ability to sustain ourselves first loses, uh, loses the fight. But of course it, you, you have uh, in any big fight uh, the problem that workers find that just striking, just disrupting isn't enough, we have to start taking control and organising things for ourselves, that's one of the problems with the disruptive model and I think the other big problem with that is the state, so if you look at uh, what's happening in Sudan at the moment, you can see that when people disrupt very, very effectively, there can be a temptation for the state to send in heavily armed people to try and smash up demonstrations, occupations uh, and strikes. And at their height, when we've seen big strike movements and direct action movements, this can lead to a situation of, if you like, dual power, where you've got both a uh, working class movement and the old regime competing as to who really runs society, who's going to provide the food, who's going to decide who gets it and who doesn't, uh, and all the rest of it. And that's when, uh, you know, in a revolutionary situation, in insurrections needed to kind of break that old uh, state of power. So that's a little bit about how. I want to talk a bit about who. Uh, Marx famously identified the working class as the agents of change. And I think one of the problems with that is that people have got some pretty mixed up ideas about why Marx advocated the working class as the agent of change. It clearly wasn't because the working class was the most numerous, it wasn't because there were more of us than anybody else. That wasn't true. When Marx was writing, the peasantry was far bigger numbers uh, than the working class. So what were those reasons? And the first and most obvious one, I think, is that we're a subordinate class. We have an interest in change. We're not the people benefiting uh, from the status quo. Uh, another key argument that you often come across is that we're a collective uh, class and certainly some of the older Marxist writings spent a lot of time contrasting the working class with the peasantry where the peasants dream was to have their own little plot of land they could grow their own crops on you know so basically break up society into little into little pieces um, and for working class people that's a nonsense so the idea that as a worker you could make a living and get all the things you need by yourself is ridiculous we rely on collective effort we none of us in our course of our jobs produce all the things we need uh, to live. But I would argue that that argument for the working class that was made strongly a hundred or so years ago is maybe a little bit less applicable in a society like Britain today. You could make to some extent similar arguments for other classes in an industrialised society that you know, if you've got middle class people, few of them can actually get all the things they need to live uh, in isolation uh, in an economy like, uh, like Edinburgh or Manchester where I'm from. Uh, but I don't think that's completely true of other classes because I don't think the, uh, pro the experience of work or the experience of struggle is collective in the same way. And that collectivity is important, I think, partly because of its link to democracy. Another feature of the working class that people point to is its concentration, is that we tend to be brought together into big towns and cities rather than scattered across uh, uh, the countryside like the peasantry was, and that clearly creates more potential for... Uh, taking power. And of course we're central to capitalism. No wheel turns, nothing gets done, nothing gets made uh, without workers, uh, workers' work, no profit gets made. But I think 
The other big problem that we've seen with an argument about the uh, working class being the agent of change is massive level of confusion about what is the working class. Um, so I think one of the most common uh, definitions is really taken from advertising, so people hear these kind of A, B, C, D, E definitions of uh, which social class people are talking about, which are based on, I think uh, I might have the date wrong, I think it was 1950s advertising categorisation, so from a period when occupational distinctions were really quite different to what they are today, and for a purpose quite different from uh, different from ours, so really not a particularly helpful guide to class. You have, I think, a very widespread view that class is cultural, it's about what you eat or what you wear, or uh, which uh, bar you go to, or how educated you are, or those kind of things. And clearly there's uh, some correlation with class in those factors, I'm not saying that they're uh, completely absent, but to reduce it to that I think becomes nonsensical when you then have some uh, CEO of a sweatshop who talks like somebody who is working class in the stereotype, uh, maybe exploiting uh, somebody who doesn't. Uh, and there's a phrase uh, from years back when there was a health strike in Scotland, uh, a nurse who was interviewed uh, saying it, it doesn't really make much difference when you're up to your armpits in blood and pus whether you once rode in a gymkhana. Uh, and I think that's quite a good summary of why uh, that falls down. Another angle I think is people look at poverty, is it simply a matter of income? But of course you can have people who are not working class, maybe self-employed people who in many cases are quite hard up and are not earning uh, a great deal of, uh, of money and similarly you can have workers who earn a fantastic amount of money. I mean, if you're a train driver uh, uh, these days on uh, many of the train companies you can earn some very good money. Uh, I know a guy who drives um, car transporters for, uh, for Ford and believe me they're on some eye-watering amounts of money, they're very well unionised and they've exploited their potential power. You see people portraying class as being about are people blue collar or white collar, I think that's a bit less common than it was maybe 20-30 years ago. And you see I, I think a, a kind of reverse view which is that it's about anybody who sells their labour to live is somehow working class which puts you know, all the senior management of most big companies then have become working class and it becomes pretty, pretty meaningless in terms of the dynamic and the conflicts of society that happen. And the Marxist view, I think, is different to all of these, which is that it's about the relationship to production. It's about uh, are you owning and controlling uh, the uh, equipment and the capital and so on that's used, or are you forced to sell your labour power? Are you benefiting from the exploitation of others, or are you being exploited? Uh, yourselves. And I think those confusions about what class is then get very much tied up with some big confusions about what class struggle is. Because I think if we talk about who is the working class, we have to say it's more than just the people who are in work on a given day. Obviously there's workers who might be out of work, there's people who might not be well enough to work, there's people who are too young to or too old uh, to work, there's people who are dependent on other people who are in are in work. The working class is bigger than just people who happen to be uh, being exploited uh, on, uh, at any particular point in time. And similarly, I think class struggle, we have to say, is more than just workplace struggle. It takes on any number of both individual and collective, uh, collective forms. I think another issue with the notion of the working class as agent of change is the idea that this means the working class alone being the agent of change. And I don't think that's ever been a particularly cunning strategy for, uh, for, for resistance. I mean, again, looking back 100 years ago, people talked about workers making alliances with the peasantry as being uh, absolutely key uh, to, change, uh, to change them. Um, but under working class leadership, setting the agenda and the direction for those struggles. And you can see the same debates happening now. I mean, I was listening to uh, uh, an interview around uh, some of what's been going on in Sudan recently, and uh, what's happened there uh, with the destruction of quite a lot of the traditional industries is vast numbers of people dependent on the informal economy. So not employees in the kind of very traditional structured sense, many people having to kind of uh, hustle and uh, uh, sell things and uh, work in the uh, irregular economy in order to get by. And you, you, you are seeing uh, an emerging alliance between those elements which aren't, strictly speaking, working class in the sense of selling their labour power in the way I'm describing, 
but coming into an alliance with the working class itself, uh, uh, with the shared agenda of getting rid of the uh, military regime. Uh, uh, the last question I want to try and answer is about where, uh, and I want to talk about the vexed question of the role of the workplace in, uh, in class struggle. And as I say, I think we have to view class struggle in quite an expansive way. It's, it's many, many different things. But I think there are several reasons we should still hang on to the idea that the workplace is uh, a particularly important uh, site of struggle. One reason is to do with different types of organising. So again, the, the American organiser, Joe McAlevey, talks, makes a distinction between what she calls structural organising and self-selecting organising. So structural organising is the idea that you have a group of people, might be a workplace, might be a housing estate, and you try and talk to everybody in that group and you try to win them over to fight over a particular issue. If you do that, you have the potential to get a bigger majority on the side and a lot of power comes from having big majorities uh, uh, that have a structural relationship with each other taking action together. That, I would say, in recent years has been a minority pursuit within the, um, uh, within the left and uh, I, um, uh, what's tended to dominate is what she calls self-selecting organising, which is where you get um, uh, people maybe putting up a stall in the city centre, handing out some leaflets, and basically finding the people who already agree with them uh, and trying to mobilise them to go and do something. And there's a place for that, don't get me wrong, but you're not probably winning over people who don't already agree with you, you're not building power uh, to the same extent. And the workplace is one of the key structural places where you can do that kind of organising. I think a second um, reason it's important is that workplace organisation is quite hard to repress. Um, so it's relatively easy to you know, drive tanks through a square that people are occupying, driving tanks through a factory has some unintended consequences for the employer. So you know, I think one of the best examples was uh, when there was the uh, resistance to apartheid in South Africa uh, there were uprisings in townships and in the workplaces going on at the same time. It was much easier for the state to repress uh, the township uprisings than it was to crush the, uh, crush the unions. Another factor is that I think the very nature of the employment relationship means that you get kind of friction between workers and their supervisors uh, because your contract can't say how hard you should work or how well you should work. All it can say is typically how, what hours you should turn up. So there's always that friction there with the boss trying to squeeze that little bit more effort out of you and you trying to get away with doing that little bit less. And that means, I think, that that friction makes class visible. And I think that it also does it, uh, the fact that conflict arises around that, it's one of the occasions where it tends to be quite clear who's on the other side. Whereas I think for a lot of our lives, sometimes, it, you know, if you talk about housing or access to services, sometimes it can feel like we're competing with other working class people and they're the problem. Uh, whereas I think workplace struggle tends to mean uh, uh, friction with, uh, with management. Um, I think it's also a site of power and I think you know, if you think of recent years, uh, we've seen some really good examples of that recently in Sudan. You know, it was the general strike that precipitated uh, the fall of the last dictator, there was a similar pattern uh, with the Egyptian uprising uh, a few years back. And obviously there's the ability to stop production, which uh, has an impact, uh, but the impact varies. I think we should be clear about it. It's not true that every workplace that has a big impact or the same, uh, same impact. I think it's really helpful to look at the kind of categories of power that uh, Beverly Silver identified. So she talked about um, people having workplace structural power. So basically, depending where you're situated, either in the whole economy or within a production process, that might give you a lot of power. So one of her favourite examples was the automotive industry, which dominated a lot of strikes in the 20th century, which tended to have a big linear production line process. So any small group of workers sit down on one particular part of the production line, the whole thing stops, thousands of workers are very rapidly involved and the economic impact is absolutely tremendous. Other examples you might think of, dockers, you know, if you shut stop the docks it has an effect, you know, wide effect across the economy or some transport like London Underground, clearly big impact uh, across, the, across the economy. So that's a kind of structural workplace power she talks about. Another type of power she talks about is associational power, that's about organisation, can you link together uh, uh, different, uh, different people. So going back to the example I talked about with the um, 
Grangemouth refinery versus the checkout staff in the supermarket. Um, for the Grangemouth staff, they had structural power. The uh, supermarket checkout staff would need a hell of a lot of associational power to be able to win to the same extent. There's no good one checkout stopping. Right? If all the others carry on, you have to all stop. Uh, and you probably need to organise quite a number of stores, maybe across even several different chains uh, of supermarkets. So associational power might be unions, it might be political organisations, it might be campaign groups, it can take a number of different forms. And she also talks about marketplace power. So that's things like how easy are you as a worker to replace. Clearly you're in a different position as a worker if when you go on strike your employer can't find a replacement for hell or high water. So if they can you know, look for a queue outside waiting for a job. But similarly there's marketplace power that's associated with how desperate you are for work. So if you have a good welfare benefit system, um, you know, that clearly puts you in a better position. It's no coincidence in the 80s that the Tories attacked the ability of the families of strikers to be able to claim benefits. Um, ready for the uh, ready for the miners strike to try and stop starve people back to work. So that's another potential form of power, and I think it's really quite helpful to think about those when you look at particular workplaces about what types of potential power particular groups of workers have got, and therefore what approaches to fighting they might have. I also think it challenges a quite gendered view of power. So people have tended to focus, I think, on the structural power because that dominated in countries like the UK in the 20th century. Uh, and perhaps that isn't quite as useful with the way that occupations and industries have changed in countries like Britain now. I think it fits quite well in big parts of China at the moment where you know a lot of the industry we had in the 20th century is now, is now happening. But if you look at you know the strike wave in the US, you can see how uh, workers in education have been absolutely key to that, that that hasn't that has had a massive impact because of their potential associational power uh, teachers particularly primary school teachers by the way not the secondary ones who tend to be better unionized but primary school teachers generally massive links with the local communities with the parents able to actually mobilize the community and have a ripple effect across the economy encouraging others to unionize um, unionize as well I think that gendered issue also comes into which issues people see as worth fighting over. So there's some work done where people, you know, you ask a bunch of workers, you know, what are your top three things you wish you could get fixed? And uh, apparently if you ask men, it's very likely to be, if you ask people in a workplace context, it's very likely to be, you know, pay and hours and, you know, very traditional, if you like, trade union issues. Uh, if you ask women, you're much more likely to get issues around housing, health, education, basically issues that surround the workplace, but frankly are the reasons we go to work in the first place, aren't they? You know, you go to work in order to have a life, not in order uh, just to have a, a good time at work. Um, so there's a notion of whole worker organising where you try and address all of the issues that people might care about. And if you can address all of those, you get people most committed and most engaged, rather than a very kind of narrow and uh, uh, kind of bread and butter view of what trade unionism should be. Um, there's been some interesting work done on how workers with different types of power can link together by a, a woman called Katie Fox Hodes, who used to uh, work for the Dockers in North America and is now an academic here in the UK. Uh, and she pointed out that though dockers are a group clearly with lots of that workplace structural power, I talked about everyone can see that if you stop the dock, it has a huge impact. Uh, but in most countries around the world, they either aren't unionised or are in completely ineffective unions, which is a bit odd when you think about it. If it's so obvious you've got all that power, why aren't you well organised? And she points out that in most countries, if you start organising dockers, you get shot or locked up. Um, and uh, that has a, a certain impact on the level of organisation and where people have successfully built strong organisation of dockers it's where uh, people have had enough associational power links with other groups beyond just relying on that narrow workplace power in order to make it politically impossible for the state or, or the employers to just use that level of repression and I think that's quite important for us thinking about our strategies that we shouldn't just focus on one type of power but actually about how we connect up groups of workers with different uh, sorts of power. Having put all those arguments why I think the workplace is so important, I do think we need a bit of balance that it's not the only location of power. So if we think of some of the uh, 
you know, important struggles in recent years, or not so recent years. You know, the poll tax, probably the last really huge win you could point to for the uh, British working class, not a workplace-centred um, struggle. You look across the channel at the Gilets Jaunes, you know, they've identified some structural power that isn't in the workplace at, uh, you know, toll booths on motorways, roundabouts, key transport uh, junctions, uh, and so on. Um, and interestingly, uh, some of the history of mass pickets in this country, I'd always thought a mass picket was turning up at a workplace and stopping people going into work, but I'm told no, it isn't. So, uh, early part of the 20th century, South Wales rail pickets, where did they pick it? Did they pick it to stop people going into work? Why would you do that when you can pick it on the railway track? You know, and to stop the trains moving. And, uh, so th there's been a tradition of people using pickets in that way that isn't necessarily relying on the workplace itself. Uh, it's that location of power. And there's an interesting argument now that maybe more will come out in the discussion about whether housing is actually more central as a, a kind of focal point of power now that uh, debt is so much more central to the way capitalism functions than was the case 50 or 100 years ago and a lot of that de debt is secured on uh, the homes people live in that are owned by uh, big and small capitalists um, uh, alike or even if they're not owned by them, the debt is owned by, uh, owned by them. So in conclusion I think what I'm trying to argue is that not every worker has great workplace power and that some non-workplace action can be powerful but I think the workplace remains a very important site of power and that we need to try and get people discussing what sorts of potential power they have, raise awareness of that power. People can only turn potential power into actual power if they're aware of it, if they're thinking about it and if they uh, you know, are willing to use it. That we need to try and promote a class agenda so we're bringing together workplace and non-workplace uh, both issues and uh, struggles so we're not counterposing them to each other in a way I think sometimes the left falls into. Uh, so not taking that kind of sectional uh, approach. Um, and I think crucially that politics matters uh, because uh, without that we're unwilling to use whatever power we might have. So if you're frightened of hurting your boss, if you don't want to uh, undermine the state that you have the misfortune to live in, if you think its survival is important, then you will pull back from using the power that you potentially have. So actually putting those political arguments about why we should use our power, why it can only be working class people that make a better world and tackle the problems I talked about at the start, I think is absolutely vital.